If you have your Bibles, um, I wonder if you might turn, first of all, to the book of Deuteronomy. I know I'm going to get to Galatians, but uh, a couple other passages just to start with. The first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. And, and I want to just contrast something um, that will come up and be beneficial for our message today. So chapter 15, go to verse 12. Just going to read uh, up through verse 18. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And, and when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock with your from your threshing floor, from your uh, fl- flock, threshing floor, and from your wine press. For what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give it to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, here's where I need you to pay attention now, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. And also to your female servant you shall do likewise. Um, And I will stop there because that's really the key of what I wanted to be able to cover. To contrast an indentured slave. Back in that culture, if you didn't have anything going for you, you could say to someone, I will serve you. I, I will be your slave. Uh, but it was able to be done for six years. The seventh year, uh, just as the seventh day, was to be a, a year of freedom. And the point was they were to be freed uh, in that seventh year. But then he talks about a unique situation where someone is serving underneath someone else And they say, I want to be your servant, your slave. I choose to be your servant and slave for the rest of my life. What the circumstances were, we don't know. Got married at that time, had children, whatever would be that's going on. Just whoever the master was, was one that was kind and treated him almost like a member of the family. We, We don't have the details, but the point was, it happened at times, and so the scriptures set up a way in which that could be done. Rather than six years and then they're gone, they're free, they choose to stay. And the way in which it would be outwardly seen is it would take an all. Do you know what an all is, A-W-L? We just don't use them very much anymore, or most of us don't. Let's put it that way. But it would be a tool that would be used for being able to, to make a hole, like through leather or, or through some other kind of, through wood, you know, where, where you just pound it through and it literally creates a hole, and then you'd put something through that hole if, if it was some other kind of item, but they're doing this to an ear. Those of you who have, you know, your pierced ears, this is nothing to you, okay? Uh, But back in those days, this was just only for that person, and they'd thrust it through, there'd be a hole, and that hole would be an outward symbol of something of a decision that they made inwardly, and that is, I am willing to be a slave for life. Now, again, you may say, why would somebody do that? Again, because in their mind, it was something advantageous about it. But pay attention to that, because as we go on, we recognize that in the time that the New Testament is being written, Rome is on the throne, and there are slaves everywhere. I mean, there were more slaves than there were Roman citizens in the Roman Empire, okay? Uh, that's, they took care of everything for you. That's what would go on. And many would mark their slaves. They'd brand them, just like we think of people out west doing with cattle. You go, well, they couldn't use the same method. Oh, yes, they could, and they did. There was a branding that would go on, and it said, you're a slave, and that's the way that you are to think of yourself, that you are a slave, but you're commanded to be one. We go to the New Testament, and we find a term that is going to be used in a number of the New Testament letters. The term 
is doulos. The term is talking about a slave. But we find a number of the New Testament writers who call themselves a doulos. They're a free man in the culture, but they recognize what Jesus Christ did for them, and they say, I willingly am his slave. I willingly am his servant. He's the master. He's the Lord. I am his doulos. I'm his servant. I'm his slave. Now, this is New Testament Christianity that I'm talking about. Uh, We find James. We find Jude. We find Paul. A number of his letters that start out, and they, they mark, I am Paul, who is, and depending on your translation, servant, slave, bond servant, but it's the same Greek word that's being used, doulos, that is there. It is someone who willingly says, I am a slave. And we go back to Deuteronomy 15 and go, you know what? There's a background with that taking place. Somebody saying, I choose to be a slave for life. Why in the world would someone in the New Testament do that if they didn't have to? And the answer was the same word that we found in Deuteronomy chapter 15, out of love. Out of love for the master, they came to the conclusion, I'm yours. Why would they do such a thing? What's the answer? Because Jesus was willing to go to the cross for them. And they were so overwhelmed. And they recognized, I can never repay him for what he's done. But what would be appropriate? And the answer is that I would give him my life because he has given his for me. The call of the New Testament is initially that you understand the message that all of us have sinned, that no one is good enough to get to God, that you could never earn a relationship with God and somehow on your own be able to to make it so that he goes, you're in. No. On our own, we fail. On our own, we pay for our own sin. On our own, we are separated from God for all eternity on our own. But the message of the New Testament is that Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross and he paid for your sin. Amen? Amen. Should not be debatable. It is out there. Should not be debatable. The Scriptures clearly lead us to this conclusion. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. He paid it all. What's necessary? That we come by faith to him. Something you've heard before, but I want to say again, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. And now we find the New Testament going on and not just expressing salvation by faith, but that we are called to live by faith. That God has a call upon your life today. That he has a plan, he has a desire that you would serve him And it's not just a matter of, all right. We ought to want to. You follow that? I'm thinking of Romans chapter 12 again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, based on the mercy that God has shown you. Has God shown you mercy? Amen. Based on the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, that you would be his servant, or his slave. The word doulos is not in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, but the concept is. And the concept is also here in the passage that we're going to go to in the book of Galatians. It's going to be talking with us about what God's call is for each and every one of us, and that is that we would be followers of his. He he says, and I'm going to pick it up at the very end of the letter, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, and as many as walk according to this rule, and the rule was, based on the verses before it, verse 15, 
in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Coming to Him by faith. That's what it's all about. It's not about the outward stuff. You got that? It's not about whether or not you marked your body uh, or your body was marked by you, you know, when you were uh, eight days old or whatever it would be. It's not about that. God's looking at your heart. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul went through some hard times. I'm going to ask you to turn to another passage for a moment. It's in Acts chapter 14. By the word, the, the term doulos is found 127 times in the New Testament. Over and over and over and over and over. Okay? It's a part of New Testament teaching. God's call upon His own is that we would willingly allow Him to be in charge. That's what God's call is to every person hearing my voice and me, that we would allow Him to be in charge. Now, in the passage here in uh, Acts chapter 14, I'm going to pick it up at the beginning of the chapter and read a little bit. Now, it happened in Iconium that they went together to the, to the synagogue of the Jews. What's going on? This is the first missionary journey Paul is on. Paul and Barnabas have left Antioch in the area of Syria, and they've traveled into an area of Asia Minor now, an area called Galatia. These three cities of uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derbe are all in this region of Galatia. It happened in uh, Iconium. They went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and Gentiles, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord. You say, wait, wait, wait. The passage not only said people got saved, but there was persecution. Why'd they stay? Because there was blessing from the Lord. Even though they were enduring persecution. Just want you to know that. They stayed there a long time, verse 3, speaking boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the work of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part sided with, with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of uh, Lyconia and the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently, seeing he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now the people saw what Paul had done. They raised their voices, uh, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the city, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothing and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature like you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good, giving us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. We call it common grace. Special grace that is information about God that we end up learning through the Scriptures. We learn from Jesus Christ, but, but we have common grace where it rains on the just and the unjust. And he's talking about that. Filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Even though they said what they said, 
they, they were bound and determined that we were, they were going to sacrifice because these are not simply men. They gave the glory to the man rather than glory to God. Verse 19, Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They continued being able to preach the gospel that God had given to them. Paul was in this region and the people were religious but superstitious. By the way, we have that today in the world that we live in. Do you know that? We've got people that are religious but don't understand who Jesus Christ truly is. There's a series of things that, that go through the motions and it's a dead liturgy that they end up following and they go through the motions because they don't know Christ in their hearts. We find at this time this was going on one minute trying to worship Paul and, and Barnabas, easily move from one belief to another, the next trying to kill Paul. And they stoned him. Paul, they thought, died. They wouldn't have stopped, except they thought they killed him. Can anybody here in the room imagine if you endured that, how you'd be doing physically? What would have happened to you? Now, I want you to go to one more passage, and that's going to be 2 Corinthians 11. And from there, we're back to Galatians for the day. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Pick it up in verse 22. Paul is needing to talk to the Corinthians about some of the same things he's had to talk to the Galatians about. They've listened to some false teachers, and they need to be able to get back to the gospel and know the truth. And so he's got to take on these false teachers that are saying, Paul's nothing, Paul's nobody. Paul's saying, look, I don't want to make it about me, but I am a servant of the Most High God. And I need you to understand that. And he goes on and talks about his own pedigree. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I, I speak as a fool. I am more. Meaning, I'm not looking to have you think I'm really something, but don't lose sight of the message that I'm bringing to you because it's the truth. And that's what you need to be able to know. So he, he's doing what he's doing. I'm more. And he goes on and gives this list. In labors more abundant, meaning he has worked harder and gone all over more than any of these other teachers. In stripes above measure. What's that mean? He was whipped. Anybody ever received one time that you got on your back or your seat something from an instrument? If you did, you still remember it. In stripes, how many? More than I could count. Above measure, he says. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often, meaning they thought I died. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. They believed 40 would kill you. So they wouldn't give you 40. They'd give you 39. Verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. By the way, I wonder what the health, wealth, prosperity gospels do with this passage. You know? Because serving Christ is not always the easiest thing in the entire world. And the godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse 28, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I have been privileged to be pastor at Payless Bible Church. 
Some guys end up going from church to church to church. And you know what? God has given me a burden for one congregation over these years. I can't imagine having a burden over multiple congregations when I realize what a burden over one congregation is. You know? But Paul had all of that. So not just the physical, it was also the emotional in the midst of all that was going on. Paul has endured it all. Now, Galatians chapter 6. Let's take on these last couple of verses. First of all, he is trying to put to death the concept of the battle over circumcision or uncircumcision. If you were brought up and you were circumcised, you were circumcised. If you were brought up and you're not circumcised, don't worry about it. It's not about the outward. It's about what's going on on the inside. That's the key. And so he says, as many as walk, verse 16 of Galatians 6, many walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. Once you trust Christ as your personal Savior, there is something God desires to do in us. And it is that we would find a peace, a peace that passes all understanding. You say, you don't know the burdens I'm going through. Look. Everybody take a moment and look at somebody else in the room. Just do that right now, would you? Okay, come back. Come on back. They've got burdens too. Whoever you looked at, they've got burdens too. It's a fact. We have a tendency to think, oh, if only everybody knew what I was going through. And we want to have a huge pity party and invite everybody. And they want to do the same thing maybe, huh? But the problem is we all have our burdens and our struggles. You know what we need? Not the absence of trials, the presence of God. And as a result, we find His peace, an inner ability to recognize things will be okay. Somebody's in charge. In the midst of all that I'm going through, God, I can handle it. Just heard this yesterday. I was just reading it through and it came across. It really caught me. Martin Luther said, you know how I think, the, the way I think of it is Christ died for me yesterday that he lives for me and he arose from the dead today and that he's coming again for me tomorrow. Can you imagine what a week would be like if you and I were able to take everything up and go, you know what? I think of Christ as if he died for me yesterday. That it's fresh. That it's not just old news. Some of us have heard things that are sublime, and we go, you know, I heard that back in Sunday school. Well, it was exciting then, and it ought to be exciting today. Yesterday, think about that. He died for my sins. Think about today, the first day of the week. It was on the first day of the week that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. That he arose for me today. I have a Savior who is living. I'm not on my own. And then I think about the future. He's coming for me tomorrow. Do we know it's tomorrow? Do we know that it could be tomorrow? The imminency of the return of Christ. Paul says, for those who have this understanding... For those who have, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 ended up telling us, you know, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or a creature. Old things being passed away, behold, all things becoming new. That same concept of being a new creation, it's the concept in verse 16. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, upon the Israel of God, uh, that, that we recognize he is with us. Peace and mercy. Verse 17. And from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul would have been a sight to see. 
I think about some individuals when I'm down at the mission, and they're not only in wheelchairs. Some of them have lost limbs. And you think, could it have been in the war? It could have been. It could have been. Or it could have been through just diabetes and, and not taking care of yourself. And the result of it is amputations have needed to be done. But, you know, you see the people and what they're going through. I see some that are, are marked by their faces. Some have been mugged, beat up. They had very little, but somebody wanted the little they had. And they had little ability to do something about it. And, and you see some of them and... I'll tell you, they just hurt to look at. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you can just tell they've had a hard, hard life. What do you think Paul looked like? First of all, he, he didn't look like King Saul in the Old Testament. He wasn't, you know, shoulders higher than anybody else. That, that wasn't him. He seems to have been more diminutive, a smaller type of individual, not, not, uh, not a he-man that would be there. If he had only been stoned that we learned about in Acts, that in itself could have marred his looks for life. But that's not all. We learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that he had one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing. Come on. After another thing. We've got to say it because he just went through so much. And wherever he wanted Wherever God led him, he knew that there might be a bullseye on his back. There were others that wanted to have that message stopped, and if they could stop that guy, it would stop the message. Paul has started this letter, and emotionally, as much as we can off of the written word, try to understand the emotional concept behind it, he feels very strongly. He's given his life for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can a person be saved? There is no other way given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ alone. The finished work of Jesus and our faith in what he did. Amen? Amen. See it. There's nothing else. Is there anything else that's being publicized that could be able to work? <sighs> Back in his day there was. In our day, there's more and more and more and more. And some people, oh, how this grieves my Lord. Some people say, you know what? There's so much error out there. I don't think you could ever learn truth. I give up. Paul cared about souls. Not the length of his life. He cared about souls. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we truly are becoming his servants, if we truly are buying into the concept that he is the master, after all that he's done, what is he worthy of? Everything that we would submit to him. He's the Lord and we are his servant. We are his doulos. If we truly understand the concept, then we understand the heart of Paul who cares about what his Lord cares about. Souls. He cares about your soul. You can know that. Nobody in this room wonders whether or not God loves you. I tell you, God loves you. He showed it. But now as his followers, he calls us to love what he loves. And I got to tell you, the heart of God cares for souls. Amen. Thank you, Rich. Body of Christ, can I get an amen? Amen. The heart of Jesus cares for souls. If you would be his follower, what is there that we need to ask God to give us? A burden, a love, a compassion, a heart for souls. That is the heart that I see in the book of Galatians by Paul. So when he sees false teachers coming in and people in Galatia, they're being swayed, does he care? You bet he cares. And he starts out the letter and he says, look, there is no other gospel that can be given. If anyone brings another gospel, let them be anathema. 
separated from God for all eternity. Whoa, hard language. Why? Because there's people that are believing the lie and drawing away from the Savior rather than toward Him. He writes a letter first explaining correct doctrines, correct information. He then, before he completes it, talks about what we ought to do as a result, applied theology. How do we live as the result of chapter 5, chapter 6? Now he's finishing the letter, but before he finishes the letter, he has said, for those true followers, you know what? Peace, mercy, (laughs) thank you, God. And then he says, you know what? My burden is souls. I don't want to be putting up with this kind of garbage stuff. Stop thinking about it. Stop focusing on who cares about whether or not the person was circumcised or uncircumcised. The issue is, have they trusted Christ as their personal Savior? That's what's important. You guys are focusing on things that aren't important. And here's what really is. And he ends up saying, and I've got to imagine if they have any picture in their mind of him being with them, they have a picture of a man who has endured much. Why has he endured much? He was a free man. In Roman society, he could have slaves doing his bidding, and he sits back and just tells them what to do. But he's given his life for the gospel. Listen up. Because I am saying this is what God is asking of each and every one of us, that we would give our life for the gospel. You say, well, well, I can go to that camp. I could do that kind of thing. How do you know what you could do? Here's the question. The question is not, can I do it? The question is, God, what do you want me to do? If I am a doulos, if I am understanding that as a, a follower of Jesus Christ, I give my life to him, then the question of the ages is, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because whatever it is, I'm willing to do it. Are you there? Wherever you call me, I will go. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Oh, Lord, remind me of what you did. And that's why that thing that I heard from Martin Luther just came out and grabbed me and went, this is exactly the mindset we need to have in order for us to be a doulas, to consider that he died for me yesterday. It's fresh. It's meaningful. We just don't think of it in the history book. We recognize this is what Jesus Christ did for who? Yeah, he died for my sin. He arose again from the dead. Do you remember going to those passages? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it doesn't matter. You find out all the places. Jesus Christ, they went to the tomb and they found it was open. And then the others that were back, you know, hiding in the upper room with the door locked, Jesus came into their midst. And when they saw him, what do you think it meant? You can't put a quotient on it. He's alive. Jesus Christ, who died, is alive. It impacted them so that we learn in the book of Acts that they were accused of this, of turning the world upside down. My friends, the world is upside down. Paul was at work turning the world right side up for a number of people who came to believe the gospel and understand who Jesus Christ is and what he is able to do in our life. The term that's used there in verse 17, from now on let no one trouble me for I bear in my body the stigma or stigmata of the marks of the Lord Jesus. Can I tell you what's happened in some situations? You know, people have ended up praying to people, praying to saints and and saying, you know, they've seen people who have had the stigmata. They have been so close to the Lord, they've sinned so little, that they literally end up having marks on their hands and on their side. Whoa! It's not about people. Who died for you? No one else but Him. 
Get your eyes off of other people. Get your eyes back where they need to be, and that is on the Lord himself. You got that? I'm telling you, I went to some websites, and there's people that are out there, and they're just going, oh, there's people that show the stigmata, and, then, and, and all the focus is on them. The focus needs to be on God. And Paul doesn't end up saying that to say, hey, look at me. He's saying, you know what? I don't want to deal with things that aren't important because I have on my body the battle scars of being a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, what do you show from being a follower of Christ? How has it affected your life that you are a doulos of his? I'm going to say this, and I'm not trying to be harsh, but I'm going to say this, brothers and sisters in Christ. We sometimes are unbelievably shallow and weak. Oh, you know what? I was trying to pray, and I hit the ground, and I stubbed a toe. Everybody, please pray for me. (laughs) Souls. That's what burned in his heart. Are you truly a doulos? We can talk the talk. Yes, we are. We all say it together. It's going to show by the decisions that you make, by the words that you share. Used to be that we would be asking God, God, put people into our life who have needs. I got news for you. God's been doing that since you were born. Here's the prayer. God, would you open my spiritual eyes to the people around me that are hurting and that need Jesus Christ. And may I share with the same fervency that somebody shared with me the gospel message. Aren't you grateful somebody talked with you about Jesus Christ? Huh? and shared with you, and the result of it is that our our life is able to be changed, our heart is able to be toward His. Paul is finishing this letter, but before he finishes, he says, come on, guys, stop getting all concerned about things that aren't important. I'm here for a temporary period of time, and i got to tell you this. I have battle scars because I am a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you and I walk in a way that one day we would hear, well done, good and faithful, what? God's call upon the life of every person who trusts Christ as their personal Savior. Father, help us today. Oh, Lord, we learn information. It's in your word. It's powerful. It's in your book. We come to learn it. But, Father, what I know that you want is not just for us to have had knowledge, but for us to be committed to you. And today, Lord, I ask that you would call us, help us to hear your voice, calling us away from the things of this world, calling us away from us being on the throne of our life, and calling us to serve you for time and eternity. That is not something we have to do. Oh, God, may it be something that we want to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.